Okay, so a review of what we've been looking at so far. So we've plotted a potential energy versus reaction coordinate or reaction progress diagram. And we've shown that in order for the reactants to turn into products, they have to go over a barrier. And until they have enough energy to go over the barrier, they can't form products. And so the kinetic energy of the molecules colliding into each other has to exceed the activation energy, and that's this distance here. Now, this here, which is sort of the point of no return, in fact, if you think of this as a mountain in a valley, so you're on a valley on one side, there is a valley on the other side, and there's a mountain in the middle, and this mountain pass, this highest point here, corresponds to what we call the transition state. And the substance that A and B are changing into, we call the transition state or the activated complex here. And it's pretty common to actually write it as AB double dagger. And so if you look at this notation here, the activated complex we indicate using the double dagger symbol. And that's a standard notation. Uh, apparently in Japanese, the, at least the story that I've heard goes something like this. The character in Japanese for crazy looks just like the double dagger. So take that for whatever you will. Uh, we've seen that we've got two different kinds of reactions, exothermic and endothermic. And in an exothermic reaction, delta H is negative, And that corresponds to the products being lower in energy than the reactants. And in an endothermic reaction... Delta H is positive, and that comes from the products being higher in energy than the reactants. So just kind of a little summary slide here. We all know that reactions get faster as the temperature goes up, and the question is why? And it's not immediately obvious. Um, for instance, if we've got a generic reaction, A plus B goes to C plus D, uh, we can probably guess the rate law is going to look something like this. It's K times by A to some power X um, times by the concentration of B to some other power. And you remember that these powers are called the orders. So X is the order with respect to A and Y is the order with respect to B. And if we sum X and Y together, we get the overall order. Now, as the temperature goes up, what's changing here? Well, actually... I mean, as the temperature goes up, um, we know that the concentrations are actually ever so slightly, depending on by how much we change the temperature, going down. And why is that? Well, we know that most solutions, as we increase the temperature, they occupy a larger volume. And molar concentrations, the number of moles over the number of liters. And so we know that if nothing else, as we increase the temperature, the concentration actually should go down. So what does that tell us about our rate law? Well, if that was the only effect, by increasing the temperature, these molar concentration terms are ever so slightly decreasing. And if that's all there was, then the rate would slightly decrease. And remember, actually, in the colligative property chapter, we said that one really nice thing about molality and percent weight is they don't change with temperature, and molarity does. And so as the solution gets warmer and expands, its molarity goes down. So if reactions get faster, we know that this constant here, K, must be the thing changing with temperature. And it turns out to have an incredibly strong exponential dependence on temperature. So as K, I'm sorry, as the temperature goes up, K goes up exponentially. And so the rate constant, although we call it a constant, it's only constant for a particular temperature. As we change the temperature, K goes up exponentially. Let's have a look at a next slide where we show how K changes with T. Okay, so this is um, a qualitative sort of picture of the rate constant K plotted versus the temperature T. And so we can see that it's an exponential increase here as the temperature gets hotter and hotter. 
the rate constant gets more and more massive. In fact, there was a lot of argument for many years over the best way to fit this equation, and so, or to fit the data, and it turns out that the Arrhenius equation is sort of the equation that most people decided is the best fit, even though it actually isn't quite the best way to fit the data. It has a really cool, neat interpretation. So we're going to go with it. Arrhenius was an interesting guy, actually. He's the guy who came up with um, the ionic theory, so the idea that things like salt broke down into ions in solution, which was considered pretty heretical. And Arrhenius also came up with things like the greenhouse effect, and he also said that maybe life on Earth started from spores from outer space landing on Earth. So quite a guy, I would say. So the Arrhenius equation, K equals A times E to the minus EA over RT, um, is the most sort of widely used form of an equation for rate constant. And all these terms, so K is the rate constant itself. A, um, well, it's given a couple of names, actually. Um, our book is calling it the frequency factor, and it's also called the pre-exponential factor. And the reason it's a pre-exponential factor is that there's an exponential term that follows. And so, since it comes before, it's the pre-exponential factor. Why frequency? Well, we can think of this roughly as the number of collisions uh, per unit time. And so, basically, A is telling us a little bit about how often the molecules are bumping into each other. Um, what about the exponential term, E to the minus EA over RT? Uh, well, we've met most of these terms already. EA is our activation energy, and it's got units of energy per mole, so joules per mole typically. R is the ideal gas constant, and if we're going to use energy units for our activation energy, the simplest value of R we can use to keep the units consistent is this value we first met in Chapter 5, um, 8.3145 joules per mole Kelvin. T's are absolute, our Kelvin temperature, and taken together, this is our Arrhenius equation. Uh, let me just go ahead and rewrite this down below. I just want to say a couple of other things about it. Um, so one is this has got, or this is either proportional to or equal to um, the number of collisions. And this term here, this term actually crops up all over the place in physics and in chemistry and geology and in biology. And this is basically a probability term. In fact, we call it a Boltzmann probability. And it turns out that this is the probability that your kinetic energy is going to be greater than or equal to the activation energy. So we're basically taking two things the number of times the molecules are colliding, and then we're multiplying by basically the chance that if they collide, they collide with enough kinetic energy to overcome the activation energy barrier.